Hello, my name is Sir Walter Scott, one of history's most famous and revered writers. I have written over 25 novels, and if you buy one of them, my face may be on the money you paid with. So Walter Scott was born on the 15th of August in 1771 in the third floor flat in College Wind in the old town of Edinburgh. Sir Walter Scott was a child genius and started at the Royal High School of Edinburgh at the age of eight in 1779. Sir Walter Scott started at the University of Edinburgh to study law at the age of 12 in 1783. Sir Walter Scott graduated from the University of Edinburgh at the age of 14 in 1786. Yay, I graduated! Walter Scott lived in Abbotsford House. He bought Abbotsford in 1811 and it was modified to his taste. It's a historic country house with a gothic architecture. The house gives you a great insight to Walter Scott's personality and interests. Hi, I am Charlotte, and I am Walter Scott's wife. I was named after my dad. I was born in 1801. Hi, my name is Anna and I was born in 1803. Hi, my name is Charles. I was born in 1805. Walter Scott's wife died in the year of 1826 at the age of 49. Walter Scott died in 1832 and he was buried at Dryborough Abbey. Walter Scott became Sir Walter Scott when he was knighted by King George IV. I decree that henceforth you shall be known as Sir Walter Scott. Uh, 1999, a pub was opened in Edinburgh called the Sir Walter Scott. Yes, sir. Yeah, give me another one. So Walter Scott's picture was put on money. The picture was painted by Henry Raybon in 1822. Hurry up, Henry. I've been sitting here all day. I'm not paying you to sit around. Following Walter Scott's death in 1832, a competition was held to design a monument to him. John Marvell won the competition. In 1844, the Sir Walter Scott Monument was completed. The tower is 200 feet 6 inches high. Today, nothing is the current mode of transport on the North the mainland, but in Scots Day, there is no such thing as nothing. They use wooden ships with masts and things like that. And behind them here is, is the island of Musa. Scott himself went to Musa. Diary entry. Tuesday the 9th of August, 1814. You enter the galleries contained in the thickness of all by two of these apertures. Through this narrow staircase, which winds round the building, you creep up to the top of the castle, which is partly ruinous. But besides the staircase, there branch off at irregular intervals horizontal galleries. 
which go round the whole building and receive air from the halls I formerly mentioned. Diary entry, Tuesday the 9th of August 1814. We get on board and in time, for the wind freshens and becomes contrary. We beat down to Subra Head through the rough weather, and as the Atlantic and German Oceans unite at this point, a frightful tide runs here. Call the Sumbra Roos, the breakers in great style upon the high, broken cliffs of Sumbra Head. They are all one white foam ascending to a great height. On the Saturday, the 6th of August, Scott writes a worst thought of the superstition. A worst and most horrid opinion prevailed, or did prevail, amongst the fishers. Namely that he who saves a drowning man will receive at his hands some deep wrong or injury. The utmost violence had been found necessary to compel the fishers to violate this inhuman prejudice. So as you saw there, the ship has crashed, and in Shetland, shipwrecks meant two things. They brought the loot ashore from the ship, but the crew, they were left to die. The of Norna was not unaptly compared to the Erie of the Osprey or Sea Eagle. It was very small and had been fabricated out of one of those stems which are called boroughs and pigs houses in Zetland. The borough of which we at present speak had been altered and repaired at a later period, probably by some petty despot or sea rover, who, tempted by the security of the situation, which occupied the whole of the projecting point of rock and was divided from the mainland by a rent or chasm of some depth, had built some additions to it in the rude style of Gothic defensive architecture, had plastered the inside with lime and clay, and brought out windows for the admission of light and air, and finally, by roof and culvert, and dividing it into stories by means of wreck wood, had converted the whole into a tower, resembling a pyramidical dovecote, formed of a double wall, still containing within its thickness that set of circular galleries which is proper to all the forts of this primitive construction. Our kinswoman, Minimotive, had clothing her dwelling well, with no more of earth than a sea fowl might rest upon, an all round sightless tempest and raging waves. Despair and magical power could not have had a fitter residence. They were advancing by a difficult, dangerous, and precarious path, which sometimes, to her great terror, had brought to the very verge of the precipice. On the white foam of the vexed ocean, which dashed, howled, and foamed, how can we keep below? Today I'll be telling you about the Exar, its strange inhabitants. From Walter Scott's story, The Pirate. He did a great job describing some char characters such as Nick Strumper and the dwarf who lives with Norna. In the Exar, he describes the dwarf's appearance in detail, making it easy for the readers to create a picture of the dwarf in their heads. To the surprise of Minna herself, a square made dwarf, about four feet five inches high, with a head of the most pretentious size and features corresponding. Namely, a huge mouth, a tremendous nose with large black nostrils, which seemed to have slit upwards, blubber lips of an unconscionable size, and huge wall eyes, with which he leered, sneered, grinned and goggled on the udler, as an old acquaintance, without uttering, however, a single word. The young women could hardly persuade themselves that they did not see before their eyes the very demon trolls.